Okay, thank you very much, guys. I'm going to start. Now, let's talk about the media. Media is a very important topic. It comes out very, very frequently, as you've seen from our analysis from past year questions. So this is the reason why I'm organizing this. Uh, last year, or was it two years ago? Uh, I think two media questions came out in one paper. One was, one, one was on balance in visual media or on media. Uh, the other one I can't quite, can't quite remember. So uh, you do have to know about the media. And I'm going to share with you three questions today on the media. The first one is on traditional media. The second question is on new media. The third question is on advertising. Three things, yeah. Uh, I believe these three will give you at least like some basic. Of course, it's not enough for you to, uh, it, it's not everything. You know, they may test you like all kinds of stuff, but it's enough uh, for a start there. Yeah? Now, when we talk about media, there are several questions that um, no, we can kind of put them into classifications. Right? Media, we can talk about the credibility of the media. Can we trust the media? We can talk about censorship and control, the government's role in the media, the freedom of speech that you enjoy, and the, uh, the treatment of journalists. Journalists, are they treated well? Are they treated poorly? Uh, and then social media questions. Yeah, this is quite new as a topic. Uh, I believe... I believe more and more questions will be geared towards social media rather than just traditional media. Or they may ask you to compare social media and traditional media. Next, uh, advertising. This is something that has come up quite often in A-level. Uh, sorry, not advertising. Uh, sensationalism. Sensationalism and advertising. Okay? They are all, I put them all in the, in the same. Um, oh, wait, let me share these slides with you. Yeah, I just remember, I haven't shared it with you yet. One second. Okay, I'll send it to you guys. Okay. We have uh, some questions I uh, put it under media, but it's more like books. They talk about books. If you read a lot, okay, this is not necessarily newspaper. If you read like, fiction, non-fiction books, watch movies, you generally will find it easy to answer such questions on books, arts, literature. Let, let's not talk about this. Uh, I don't consider the media, okay? I don't know why I put it there. Media questions, you can maybe put them into categories. I have trouble categorizing media questions because it's so, they, they can test you in so many ways. But okay, I try my best. Uh, censorship, credibility, sense, sensationalism. Okay, talk about clickbait, talk about... Um, talk about hyper-partisanship, okay. propaganda, persuasion, talk about fake news uh, or falsehood, uh, this idea of marketplace of ideas, which is that, you know, you can just post whatever you want. The ideas that are bad will eventually die out. The ideas that are good will be, you know, people will receive it, they will, uh, they will assimilate it, a marketplace of ideas. Revenue and readership, uh, talking about money. Uh, if you... Uh, get a question on media, like the word media appears in the question. You can actually use these three things as the example. The first one is the Johannes Gutenberg, uh, the, the Gutenberg printing press, the first printing press that was created 500 years ago by a German inventor. Done. Okay, so that is the history of the media. Yeah, you can say uh, the origin of the media probably started 500 years ago with the invention of Johannes Gutenberg's printing press. Done. Or oh, the Gutenberg printing press. The other word you can use, uh, the other bang you can use, right, is this word post-truth. Post-truth was, was, was voted, can I say voted? It was selected as the word of the year in 2016. So the reason is that a lot of people started believing not in facts, but in whatever that made them feel better made them feel something. So we live in the post-truth era uh, uh, because you know, uh, largely driven by media and maybe the, me the new media. And this person, Jim Morrison, is a singer. He said, whoever controls the media controls the mind. Okay? If you don't know how to start, uh, these are some standard starting that you can use. Uh, let's see. No, you guys come from a different school. So yeah, don't worry. <laughs> you can use the same ones. Let's look at the first question today. Okay, we talk, I say I, I'm going to talk about traditional media, right? So here's the one on traditional media. Traditional media includes these, I would say, three things. Okay, What you see, what you hear, and what you hear and see. 
So that's newspapers, magazines, what you see, radio, what you hear, TV, what you hear and see, these three things. Traditional media, when you, when you see the word traditional media or the media, the media generally refers to the media industry. That means these people, they make money from selling content. They go and gather the news, they make money. You publish content on Instagram, on YouTube, but you don't make money from it. Yeah, Unlike a journalist, a journalist actually gets paid to write something. When you write something, nobody pays you. So there's a difference between traditional and new media. Now, traditional media, oh, you know, this is this is not the question. Let's forget it. Why is it here? My bad. Okay, forget about this. Huh. This is not the correct question. Huh? This is uh, media outlet still relevant today. Mistake. I was rushing this up. Uh, media outlet still relevant today. Uh, there are some problems with traditional media. Remember these three problems. Number one, media consolidation. Number two, hyper-partisanship. Number three, government control in some countries, not all countries. Some countries just, just memorize these three things. Uh, and there are some good of traditional media. Number one is investigative journalism. Number two, hey, wait, that's not merits. There's problems. You see, that's what happens when you try to rush things. Yeah, avatarial. Now uh, let's look at the first one, media consolidation. So these are the four, five, the four problems. Uh, media consolidation. In the past, there were, in 1980s, right? 90% of American media was owned by 50 companies. Today, the same percentage is owned by just six companies over here. So the problem with this is that there will be reduced media plurality, right? And uh, concentrate, uh, the media ownership becomes very concentrated in the hands of a few people or corporations. What is the problem with that? Okay. It compromises editorial integrity. Now, this one, if it doesn't mean anything to you, let me explain. Editorial integrity is how easily uh, people are, is the media influenced? It is very easy for, let's say I'm a government or I'm a powerful person. I can influence six companies very easily. I mean, there's just six companies. I can buy them and that's all. Yeah, but it's a lot harder for me to influence 50 different companies. Got it? So that is what we mean by editorial integrity. Yeah, so they're very subject. And now the, the media has become so consolidated that it's very easy to manipulate it. Use this as your example. You can also talk about this. Six corporations control 90% of the media outlets. Yeah, so you can talk about those six companies. What are the six companies? Okay, you just got to know some of these companies. Eh? Comcast, Disney, uh, these two. Okay, Comcast and Disney. Comcast owns all this. Okay, CNBC, MSNBC, uh, NBC Sports, NBC, New uh, NBC News, Hulu, Universal Studio. Uh, okay, all this. BuzzFeed, Comcast owns all these companies. Uh, Disney is not here, but Disney owns ESPN, Disney, most of the movies you watch actually. Right. Now the next problem, the second problem with the media is hyper-partisanship. Media is supposed to be objective, meaning, uh, sorry, not objective, it's supposed to be neutral and not biased, but media these days have become more and more biased. Uh, most of the media companies fall not in the center of this spectrum, but either lean towards the left or the right. And these are the media companies that tend to do very well. CNN, left-leaning. Fox News, very successful, right-leaning. Yeah, The Guardian, left-leaning. Uh, Wall Street uh, Journal, right-leaning. So you can see very few companies lie in this like middle spectrum these days. Yeah? Even BBC, I consider it left-leaning. So I would say there are only very few companies like routers, economies that still maintain neutrality in their reporting. Yeah. So two problems. The third problem with the media is government control. I would like to give you this case study on Turkey. This guy, Rasip Tayyip Erdogan, or you can just call him Erdogan. He is the president of Turkey. Ever since he took power, he has been silencing the media like crazy. He's been taking... Uh, some newspapers down. He's been buying some newspapers that used to be against him now because he bought it. He owns these newspapers. He, um, he has power. He has control over uh, the editors. So in 
2016, yeah, Erdogan shut down 16 TV channels, 23 radio channels, 45 newspapers, 50 magazines, 29 publishing houses. All in all, I think I counted it's about 100. <laughs> 100 TV channels, new uh, radio stations. So, it, uh, so in your uh, example, you just say 100 uh, media outlets. So they can be, media outlets is just broad. Yeah? So he shut them down. At the same time, he throws journalists into jail. This was from, oh, which year is that? I think two years ago. There are still 120 journalists in jail in Turkey. So this is also a form of censorship, but it's a bit a lot more hardcore than just censorship. Yeah? Rather than telling you not, what not to say, it is putting you in jail. Yeah. It's a form of control, government control. And this year, Turkey says they, are, they want to control social media as well. They want, to, uh, they want all social media companies that operate in Turkey to have a representative that is Turkish to have a nominated representative. This will kind of control the social... So, so these representatives will have a say on what they can or cannot publish on what posts to take down. Therefore, uh, the Turkish president is trying to exert influence using regulations, even on uh, social media. Now, this is not traditional media. Take note that this is social media. Uh, but I just want you to note this. Uh, I just put it here because it's, they are all related to Turkey and how bad it is for media companies in Turkey. Yeah. Uh, learn about Turkey, because I know everyone's going to talk about North Korea and China. <laughs> okay, this is very boring. Okay. You can use Turkey to vary your examples a little bit. All right, next up is on... The slides are everywhere. Okay. I don't think this is relevant. I'm going to send you guys again this thing. Just look at this slide. The good thing about the media is... Uh, invest. Oh wait, there's another bad thing about the media is editor advertorial. Advertorial is a uh, portmanteau. The word advertisement and editorial. Okay, they're put together. So advertisements usually you can see very clearly. You know this is an ad. You're not gonna believe in it. You 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 approach an ad very differently as when you approach an article. When it is an article like an editorial, you tend to believe it more. However. Uh, companies have been, newspaper companies, because their revenue has been going down, there's this, there is this shift towards more and more uh, what we call native advertising kind of content, advertorial. Advertisements that disguise themselves as uh, articles, as factual information. Okay? So this is by New York Times. New York Times published an advertorial, or actually not just one, but a series of advertorials for ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil pays them, say, Please publish an article that says that climate change is not real. Publish an article, article that says that fossil fuel is not responsible for climate change or human beings are not responsible or the world is not really warming that much or it, it is the sun, it is not the earth, you know, the sun is getting too hot, the, the earth hasn't, hasn't changed quite a, a bit. So all these fake signs, uh, these misleading signs by ExxonMobil, yeah, they are publishing the articles through uh, companies like New York Times because New York Times, they're desperate, right? They need money and ExxonMobil is willing to pay them whatever to publish misleading articles like this. Last week, companies like ExxonMobil, uh, I think uh, Chevron, these companies have been grilled by the Congress in the US because they are uh, being accused of launching a very deliberate misinformation campaign or rather not one, but multiple misinformation campaigns on climate change. Now, these companies, uh, oil and gas companies, they have learned their mistake there. They're like, okay, we can't hide this anymore. So they are, they are, they are changing their stance. They say, okay, okay we're going to do something about um, oil and gas. We're going to shift more towards renewable energy. Yeah. So, good example for you to use for advertorial. Right, so those are the problems with traditional media. What about the, uh, the good thing? The good thing of traditional media, I'll share with you. Now, uh, remember this International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, ICIJ. Yeah? So ICIJ recently published an art, uh, a, leak, a lot of documents. They call it the Pandora Paper. The Pan Pandora Papers, I think. The Pandora Papers 
reveal how a lot of rich people are hiding their assets using companies offshore because they want privacy. They don't, they don't want you to know how much they own. So the King of Jordan is involved. Uh, what else? Uh, some very powerful business uh, uh, politicians like Tony Blair, the former Prime Minister of UK, he was involved. So he's been use, using these companies, like they're called trust companies. He's been using trust companies to hide his asset. So the asset is not under his name, it's under this, these trust companies. So you can't, you don't know what he owns. Yeah. Oh, uh, Singapore is also involved. Uh, the, there's a company called Asia City that has been helping clients. That, Asia City is a trust company. It's been helping clients from Australia, from everywhere in the world, those rich and powerful, to hide their assets in places like Samoa. Okay? Uh, one day, maybe I will hire them. Yeah? <laughs> Hopefully, I have so much money, I can hide my assets in Samoa. Now, if you remember ICIJ, they are not, uh, this is uh, not the first paper they published. They published a Panama paper, they published a, a Paradise paper. Paradise paper was pretty, pretty similar. It was in 2017. You don't have to know it anymore because you, know, you have a more updated example here. Pandora paper, single R. Next. Another investigated, I like this one because it's you now the story to it. It's about the opioid crisis in America. The Washington Post, all right, do remember, whenever you see the word the Post, okay, uh, or it means the Washington Post. The Washington Post is one of the most responsible for investigative journalism. Yeah, they have they won so many awards for investigative journalism. So if you forget, right, oh, what's the newspaper that oh, what, what is it? Okay, Washington Post, okay. Um for, for recent in recent years at least. The Washington Post um, investigated, they followed the trail of opium, opioid uh, drugs, which is a kind of painkiller that is highly addictive and it can cause overdose. It's basically a, a drug that is prescribed as a medicine. And when I say drug, I, I mean like a drug that makes you go high, the kind of drug. Uh, this drug has been prescribed very liberally by doctors. And a lot of people, as a result, they have died from overdose. Why? Because they develop addiction. It started off with a back pain and they would go to the doctor. The doctor tells them, uh, I think your back pain, you got to take this opium. And then they're like, ah, you know, you, uh, the doctors are like, um, you got to take this uh, opium. It's going to help you with your pain. Don't worry about addiction. It's not that bad. Yeah, so they're misleading the patients. Once the patients start taking these drugs, they become addicted to it. And then they die from it eventually. Now, uh, who... Uh, why is this happening? It's a systemic problem all over the U.S. So many people have died from uh, drug overdose. They have called this thing the opioid crisis. The reason is pharmaceutical companies are paying doctors a lot of money to push these drugs to the patients. Now, it is the pharmaceutical companies, the powerful, rich companies. So the Washington Post over the years, uh, I think ever since, uh, since 2016, they have been following this. Um, this development and they published some articles and even a documentary, I believe last year or in 2019, yeah, to expose this opium, opioid crisis. I keep saying opium, but they are the same. You know opium, right? The opium war. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, they, they are addictive. Okay, let's just take a short break right now. Okay, I am on schedule. Anyone has questions so far on this? Are media alerts still relevant today? You can type out, you can say, okay. All right. Now, um, just to summarize, we talked about are media outlets still relevant today? The conclusion is not relevant. Not relevant, okay? So don't try to force points out of, uh, they're very relevant today. When we talk about media outlets, we talk about traditional media outlets. So there are problems with consolidation, hyper-partisanship, government control, and you know misleading advertisements uh, to, to bolster their revenue. These four things, okay? The only thing, uh, that you need to remember for how they're good, right? Investigative journalism. Now, if you study lazy sheets and others, you have more, but I just need you to know these five for today. All right, I'm going to move on to the next question on mass media has changed for the better. 
you see, when you talk about media, how media has changed, are we talking about traditional media or uh, new media? Traditional or new media, okay? So, are we talking about just traditional media or a combination of traditional and new media? Yeah? Can you tell, can you write in the chat? Traditional or combination? Oh, very good. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So do remember, guys, every time we talk about change, is how media has transformed from past to present. So there are two kinds of media you can look at and compare traditional and new media. That means, guys, in your, ex uh, in your explanation, you want to capture the change. Um, you you want to capture the change, you want to compare a little bit with traditional media. Yeah, you can do it for... Practically, yeah, most paragraphs, almost every single paragraph you can compare traditional and new media. That's how you capture change. So let's look at this. Mass media has changed for the better. Now, as a GP student, always look at the world in a dark, you know, uh, in a dark way. Look at, the, look at the dark, horrible side of everything because you are tested on your critical thinking. To be critical means to see things in a more negative way. So there are uh, merits of new media, problems with new, new media. Let's talk about the merits first. Number one, democratization of information. This one, I don't have a lot of slides for you. I'm just, uh, I'm just gonna tell you verbally. Yeah? Uh, democratization of information is when everyone can post, everyone can share their news. In the past, you can't have a voice, but now everyone has a voice. You, know, you can share news, you can share uh, those who study citizen journalism, this is also a form of democratization. At the same time, people have access to media everywhere in the world. Unless you're in China or, now, or North Korea, you can practically access all the news, new, most of the news websites elsewhere. Right? Uh, now, new media also gives the minority a voice so that they can... Uh, so uh, we're talking about uh, Facebook, Instagram, all these uh, social media. Uh, when the minority have a voice, you know, it... Uh, they have better representation. They can overcome other things like discrimination. They have more rights in the workplace, yada, yada, all these things. Okay, the problems with new media are many. Okay, number one, falsehood. Number two, hate speech and division. I put them together because it's, you know, uh, it's easy for you to put them together. Number three, radicalization. Number four is selectivism. This four. Uh, the first three are very important. Every time we talk about the problems with freedom of speech, you can also look at the first three. Freedom of speech, should we have freedom of speech? These are the three reasons why you should not have freedom of speech. Yeah, you can, you know, you can radicalize people, you can result in division, falsehood, all that stuff. All right, let's jump into it. Like I said, I don't have a lot of information here, so you've got to listen carefully. Democratization of information, okay, everyone can post nowadays in Arab Spring, uh, in, in the Middle East. Uh, ever since 2011, Arab countries have been using social media to challenge the government. At the time, the government was pretty authoritarian. So you could safely say that social media is the tool against authoritarianism. Yeah. So it promotes freedom, it promotes democracy, everyone gets a voice. Uh, in China, even in a country like China, you might say that oh, China has no censorship so, so heavy and all that, but it is still possible for people to use codified language. Codified language is like codes, and maybe they change the wording a little bit, but they're actually, actually referring to something else. Yeah, maybe instead of saying Xi Jinping, they use like maybe some other words that everybody understands. Uh, when Liu Xiaobo died, Liu Xiaobo is the activist in China. He won the Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize. When he died, people started talking about Liu Xiaobo, but you can't, Mention Liu Xiaobo on Chinese uh, social media because it's banned. <laughs> it's banned by the, uh, the platforms. It's banned by the government. You can't mention him. So some people started turning to other words like Liu Lao Shi, you know, uh, teacher Liu. Okay. Uh, that's, that's democratization of information yeah, through social media. With traditional media, you don't get access to that kind of information. You also don't get access to... You also don't get the the chance to publish such information. 
Oh yeah, giving the minority a voice. I'm not going to talk much. This one, you know how to explain. Black Lives Matter, Oscar So White. This is uh, about Oscar. How Oscar in the past, they kept giving the awards to, you know, white producers, white actors, actresses. Uh, but nowadays, they are shifting. They are giving it to, you know, um, you know black actors, Asian actors. Uh, recently, I think it was, what is it? Korean, yeah? Uh, so what, what was it? The Oscar winning... Award winning show, Parasite, I think. Yeah. All right, the next thing is falsehood. Now, do take note, guys. Do not use fake news in your topic sentence. Let me repeat that. Do not say fake news in the topic sentence. Fake news is a very specific kind of uh, falsehood, misinformation. You can talk about misinformation. You can talk about falsehood. Yeah? In your topic sentence, fake news, reserve it for your example. Now, every time I talk about fake news, I always say this, fake news refers to either conspiracy theories or hoaxes. Other things, let's not consider them fake news. Okay, I, I want to define the scope because a lot of people use the word fake news wrongly. Okay? Everything starts to, people start to call it fake news. It's not fake news. It's a very specific kind of news. Conspiracy theory is when you say that Oh, you know, the uh, the uh, some organizations are trying to cover up the news, don't trust them. There's a lot of like, there's a syndicate going on, people are colluding with one another in order to exploit the people, in order to mislead the people. Okay, that's a conspiracy theory. It may be true, it may not be true, but the problem is once people believe in conspiracy theories, they will not, they reject all kinds of evidence that's presented to them. Try talking to someone who believes that the earth is flat. Yeah, you can fly them to space, show them, look, that's earth, it's spherical. Are you happy now? They will tell you it's fake. The spacecraft that you put me in is fake. <laughs> okay, because they have you know, they have believed that organizations are trying to mislead you. That's the danger of conspiracy theory. It's the same thing that happened during the US election, even though. Uh, the evidence was overwhelming that Joe Biden won the election. Donald Trump supporters still were very angry. They were like, no, you are lying to us. The Congress, everyone is lying to us. Donald Trump was the rightful winner because they believe in the conspiracy theory. Whoever told them otherwise is labeled as you know, lying to them. Uh, a few fake news that you can talk about, Pisage, flat earth theory, uh, vaccine as a bioweapon uh, developed in China, developed in the US. Vaccine, oh, sorry, what am I saying? COVID-19. COVID-19 as a bioweapon. Okay. Now, the next thing is on hate speech and division. Social media is very good at dividing people. Sometimes through hate speech, sometimes just through like what uh, the, the things you see. So this is what the Facebook um, executives write uh, what they say. They say, our algorithms exploit the human's brains, the human brain's attraction to divisiveness. So this company, Facebook, already knows that people love divisive content. People love it. The longer you read divisive content, the longer you will stay on their platform, which is great, right? However, however, uh, the you see, they continue to let people publish content that is divisive. They continue to run the algorithm in such a way that is divisive, just because they want to maximize the time spent on social media on their platform, and as a result, to maximize their profit. So they put profit above, I would say, public good. Uh, so you can read more about this. You can just Google this. You can read this particular, uh, should I say, article. Yeah. Uh, okay. Facebook, they are well aware that it stopped polarization and this divisiveness, yet they continue uh, operating in such a way that is against public good. Next thing is radicalization. You know Reddit. You might know Chan, these are websites where there are pockets of communities that can spread very radical views. When I say radical, it's not just about hate speech. Radical can be um, 
related to violence. There's a big difference between hate speech and radicalization. Radicalization is almost like telling you to kill someone. So the teenager who was arrested in Singapore for plotting a mosque attack, right? He was radicalized on Reddit and H Chan. He was very uh, drawn to the ideologies on far right groups on these websites. It is only possible through what? Through social media. You don't see these radicalized, radicalizing content on uh, traditional media. Now, of course, if you want to talk about terrorism, that's fine as well. I, uh, this is a form of terrorism, honestly. Hey, oh, uh, in fact, right, I tell you something. ISIS, in its heyday, ISIS used social media to recruit uh, youngsters. Yeah, you, they don't recruit on... On, they don't recruit on newspapers, of course. They recruit on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and all that. Okay, the next problem with social media, some of you can use this. Not a super strong point, but you can probably use this for other kinds of questions on social media. Is the problem with selectivism or clicktivism. You click something, you put a hashtag, you think you're doing something good. You're, you're, you're making the world a better place. But that's not always true. Yeah, online movements barely translate into offline actions. So you can see like there's a lot of online movement about, oh, stop animal cruelty, oh, veganism, plant-based diet. Da, 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 okay. Yet, <laughs> only 1% of the world is vegetarian. Okay? So it doesn't translate to behavior. There were people who, uh, who, who went uh, online to publish things like Earth Hour, hashtag Earth Hour, you know, hashtag Save the World, whatever. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, oh, Stanley, 4chan and 8chan, I think they are, they are related, yeah, but not the same. Yeah? So I'm not too sure. It could be 4chan, it could be 8chan. Yeah? Sorry, we, we, we were talking at this point. 8chan or 4chan. Okay. I cannot ascertain which one it is, but they both exist. Hey, so... Let's talk about the actions. Uh, our behaviors rarely change just because we published something online. Okay? You can repost Greta Thunberg many times, but it makes no sense when you're still using plastic bags and uh, you know, using air conditioning, driving to work, all that stuff. So that's selectivism. Next, uh, okay, next we're going to talk about advertisement. Before that, any question on this mass media? Okay, this question, the focus is on the change. Therefore, we are looking into social media and new media, yeah? Any question? Selectivism. Can I explain selectivism again? Yes. Selectivism, you just say that people develop a habit of uh, this misconception that posting online is going to make the world a better place. So they become very passive, uh, become very lazy. It promotes laziness. Very often, all these posts online, all this online activity rarely translates to concrete and uh, you know, beneficial actions. Now, when, we, when I say actions, it's some, it usually involves behavioral change. Uh -huh. For the first question, we'll talk about investigative journalism. Can we use internet watchdog journalism? Uh, okay, investigative journalism, is it the same as watchdog journalism? Yep, correct. They are the same. In fact, the word watchdog will appear in your explanation when you talk about investigative journalism because it is to you know, keep the government, keep the powerful accountable. They're functioning as a watchdog or to have some checks and balances uh, in the government. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. Watchdog, investigative journalism, they are pretty synonymous. Okay. Now, I will go on to the next question. If your question is where you note it down, later on we have a QA. Hey, consider the effectiveness of advertisements today. I will just talk about some problematic advertisements for this in case advertisements come out. <laughs> Okay, advertisements. Now this about native advertising, you can go and have a read. I, mean, I don't think you're in the mood to watch videos, but uh, I'll just explain to you a little bit. Native advertising is mixing advertisements with original content so that they blend into each other. 
Now, native advertising is a way to kind of mislead the viewers, the readers. Right? It's a bit confusing to the readers when your advertisements look like an editorial, look like an uh, editorial, like what we saw in editorial, right? That's a form of native advertising. The reason this is happening is that media companies are seeing their profits shrinking. When the profits shrink, what happens? When the profits shrink, they have to find other ways to make money. So they turn to the advertisers and say, hey, you know, I can go the extra length for you. Do you want me to lie to the people? I'll lie for you. Or do you want me to mislead the people? I'll do it for you. Yeah, you just got to pay me a bit more. Okay, so that's one controversial kind of advertisement. Right, let's look at this uh, problematic advertisements. I'll just show you. Advertisements, um, are they effective? Sometimes they can backfire when it is insensitive towards maybe uh, uh, some people, towards a minority. So this ePay, if you remember, it was involved in the brown face incident. The brown face incident let this group of people, okay, this is uh, Pretty Please and Subhas Nair, these two, they are brother and sister. Um, it led them to create a rap video. That rap video actually talked bad about this uh, particular advertisement and it actually highlighted other racial issues that they were unhappy about. So Subhas Nair, right, and Pretty Please, they were given warning and then eventually they were, uh, after they were given warning uh, for their rap video, uh, Subhas and I went on, I think recently went on to post something online that actually is the racial uh, ill will between different races. That's what the court says. They try to make, uh, try to, what's another way to put it? Try to raise tension, racial ten, raise racial tension in Singapore. All right. Now, this is nothing to do with advertisement, okay? but this is something that you can use for freedom of speech, but they are related, they are the same case. Yeah? This is the bad advertisement, the brown face advertisement. Next, uh, Duff, uh, I mean, you look at this, 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 you know the story, right? A black lady, remove her shirt, ta-da, becomes a white lady. Yeah. So this is a Duff advertisement. Uh, you know, they, people are so sensitive nowadays. I think they did not intend, Duff it has, has always been a company that um, that promotes diversity. If you look at the advertisements, right, they use a variety of ladies as their models. Okay, um, you know, uh, skinny one, fat ones, black, white. Okay, all kinds of um, I would say all kinds of women uh, for the advertisement because they target women. By the way, uh, <coughs> Dove, okay, somehow, okay. Even being such an uh, inclusive company, somehow got uh, so offended a lot of people. So people are becoming very, very sensitive these days. Everything can be construed as racist. Yeah. So advertisers have to be very, very careful. So there are different points. Huh? So this is advertising, backfire here. Advertisements have to, advertisers have to be super careful these days. Yeah. Uh, it's also one of the reasons is the woke culture. W-O-K-E, the woke culture is, you know, is you know, people are just trying to find things to criticize, trying to outdo one another on their morality. Right? So they can sit on the moral high house and say, you see, I'm more woke than you, therefore I'm a better person. Okay, this, quest, uh, this point is about how advertisements are no longer effective because people don't want to see advertisements anymore. If you're an advertiser in 2021, it's bad news for you because people will pay to not see your advertisements. People are sick of advertisements. Netflix is one of such companies that say, we'll give you content without advertisement. Do you want it? The only thing is you have to pay me. People say, okay, take my money. I don't want to see advertisements. Netflix has 200 million subscribers today. 200 million is about, well, yeah, uh, about two-thirds the size of the U of US. Yeah. So its annual revenue is 25 billion. Netflix is not just one of them. It's not just um, uh, the only company. There are a lot. Yeah? There's Disney Plus, Amazon Prime Video, HBO Go, Hulu, Netflix. I'm sure you know more than me. The other thing about advertisement is it's starting to become, people start to 
uh, trust advertisements less and less. If you are going to purchase something, very often what you do, you go on to see the reviews, not just rely on the advertisements these days. Social media or rather internet platforms have created an environment when people can share um, their experience about the product. Yeah. So if you don't like my classes, you can go online and share it as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you like my classes, you can go online and share it as well. Okay. So reviews are that important. So there are many reviews, uh, review companies, trip advisor, Google reviews, Facebook reviews, Yelp reviews. So you can use these examples, just name drop them to talk about how advertisements, people no longer rely on advertisements to make decisions. Uh, I did not, uh, I feel to include YouTube reviews here. Yeah, I think YouTube review is one of the best ones. You want to buy a laptop, the first thing you do, YouTube review, laptop, blah, 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 blah. Is that right? So this is how consumers make the decisions these days. Oh, this one you can ignore. Uh, okay. Advertisements sometimes are still important. In some rare occasions, advertisements have... Uh, oh, okay. Repeat what thing to the US side. Okay, let me come back to that. Uh, advertisements have an educational purpose. Now, if I advertise a laptop, I advertise a detergent and all this, okay, they, if I run advertisements on these things, they don't have uh, a huge impact on you. Okay, you, you, you still will buy whatever you like. Okay, It's harder for me to influence you. But what if I give you something that you've never seen before? Yeah, then that advertisement has a very important purpose. I mean, let's say a detergent. There's so many detergents. I, I know what a, de what a detergent is. But did you know what these things were if they were not advertised? Yeah. I'm sure you guys see a lot of Grammarly, you know, this, this uh, advertisement. Now, before you saw Grammarly, you didn't know there are such tools. They're new. They're innovative. Apple Watch, Smart Watch, when it first came out, nobody knew what it was. There was such a thing. Yeah, and you know this flip phone, um, like new smart flip phone. Yeah, we never knew these innovative products existed until we actually saw advertisements about them. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that's why Henry Ford said, right? If I had asked my customers what they wanted, Henry Ford was a car maker. He made the first car in the world. And he said, if I ask customers what they wanted, they will say they want faster horses because they never knew this thing, cars existed. They never knew. Uh, oh, I was talking about uh, Netflix. Uh, 200 million subscribers. Uh, Qingtiao, you, were, you asked me what's two-thirds size of US. I just wanted to uh, make a comparison. What is 200 million people? That's two-thirds the size of US population. US population is 300 million. Yeah. <clears throat> 200 million, I think, is the size of the entire Indonesia, uh, entire, is it Philippines or Indonesia? Huh? Can't remember. Yeah, so just for scale, for you to understand 200 million, how big is it? Okay, I have a bit of case study here before I move on. Uh, oh, yeah, before that, advertisements, any questions? Not super likely to come up, but just to be sure, I share with you some examples. Questions? Are political campaigns considered advertisements? Yes, they are. If they advertise. <laughs> political campaigns is like an umbrella term. A campaign can be, I go out to speak, you know, Joe Biden is it, or Donald Trump speak on the rostrum, make America great again. Uh, okay, that's a campaign. Yeah. An advertisement is something they created, like a post that they either publish on a traditional newspaper or publish on social media. So, uh, yes and no, okay. Uh, advert is a subset of political campaigns. You remember Cambridge Analytica, right? So that is the data gathered from Cambridge Analytica is used to create what we call a psychometric profile, psychometric profile of the users so that they can, uh, so that 
if I'm Donald Trump, the political campaigners can use this data to target the readers, the social media users more effectively to influence them. So that is used on social media. So yes, they ran advertisements using Cambridge Analytica data. Okay. Okay, if you have questions, you can continue typing. I'm gonna finish up these slides and then that's all, yeah? That's all for this lecture on the media. This is, oh wait, this guy, I like him, he's Rupert Murdoch. He's very, very infamous because he's very rich, yet he's very controversial because he has, um, he's been in uh, court several times. He has uh, uh, been involved in some scandals, yet he's one of the richest men in media. So Rupert Murdoch, what do you have to know about him? These are the six things you need to know about Rupert Murdoch. The first one, Rupert Murdoch controls 70% of Australia's print media. 70 percent yeah so he has a lot of political influence a lot of influence not just political influence if he owns these newspapers it's very unlikely for the newspapers to talk shit about him right so this goes back to our point on uh media consolidation the one we talked about earlier no? the six companies so he owns he owns news corp he owns a bit of Disney. He owns, oh yeah, these two companies. He owns these two companies. Does he own other? Okay. All right. Next, he is the inventor of modern tabloid. Modern tabloid, you know tabloid, right? Newspapers that only publish very juicy but inconsequential news, you know? Oh, Man killed wife by stabbing her 20 times. It's, it's not important. <laughs> this kind of like crime, scandals, or you know, um, man went out with mistress and was caught, like, all that stuff. It's uh yeah, it's a feature of tabloid, sensational but inconsequential news. However, because of tabloid, he made a lot of money. That goes to show one thing. Yeah, people don't like real quality news. People like to read junk news, like you know, tabloid news. So Rupert Murdoch bought The Sun, uh, which is a British newspaper. He went from Australia, his original country. He flew to the UK. He bought The Sun. And then he turned it, uh, he, he ran a lot of uh, stories on scandals. Uh, he turned it into a tabloid. And then The Sun started making a lot of money. Today, The Sun is still one of the biggest tabloid newspapers in the UK, thanks to Rupert Murdoch. So he's pretty, pretty smart, uh, this guy. He knows what readers want. Rupert Murdoch, uh, the other thing is, let's talk about media ownership. You know, a lot of countries say, that, oh, you know, it's, uh, if, if, you are, if you stop foreign media to report, to report on your country, it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of like meddling with local domestic affairs. But that is uh, something that everybody does. Every country does that. Even the US does that. The US does not allow any foreigner to own TV stations. You have to be a US citizen to own US TV stations. Doesn't that say something? That shows that you know, the media is a very sensitive thing that countries only countries want to have control over. They do not want foreign companies to interfere with the media. I'm very sure US companies, uh, you, the US government will not let any Russian or Chinese uh, government or companies buy up US media. It will be illegal. Yeah. So in the same way, you know, Singapore government does not allow foreign companies to buy up certain, like, to buy up Singapore media companies. So anyway, Rupert Murdoch, he took up US citizenship just so that he could own US TV stations. Okay, the fifth thing you need to know about uh, Rupert Murdoch is this very, very scandalous thing called News of the World. This newspaper was involved in phone hacking. They hacked the voicemail of famous people or high-profile people like the British royal family, 
cabinet ministers, actors, and even the family of Millie Dowler, who was a schoolgirl who, who got murdered. So he, his company hacked their, their phones so that they could get exclusive stories. These exclusive stories are for profit. When you publish these stories, then you know, you'll be, you can sell newspapers, you can sell more, sell more papers. And then you can talk about uh, Rupert Murdoch, how powerful he is. His empire spans across four continents. You know? I think North, South America, Asia, and Australia. Australia, Europe, Asia. Uh, that's five. Oh, sorry. North America, Europe, Asia, Australia, four continents. This, these are some of the companies that he owns, including Wall Street Journal. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, that's it. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah, you, I'll, I'll send the updated slides to you guys, okay? Uh, because you know, this one is a bit screwed up. I hope this uh, media lecture gives you a bit more knowledge or helps you review some of the things that you've learned on media yeah so that's all for this lecture if you have questions you can you're free to stay back to ask me if not you can go for your lunch thank you very much for your attention i'll see you bye bye thank you thank you bye thank you yeah see ya thank you hi <laughs> bye thank you see ya bye bye oh these are some characteristics of social media Eh? I did social media characteristics uh, eh? <laughs> over here is is democratized it gives a minority a voice it perpetuates false food is yeah, yeah. these are okay characteristics you can say is democratized it is fast Let's see it is fast which I didn't include here yeah so these are the characteristics of social media when you say characteristics I'm comparing it to traditional media yeah. Sally, will you do you have something else in mind? You know, I was like thinking like because right, uh every time like questions on media, like I think it's more like they require the characteristics rather more of like the problem, you know. The pro like the teachers want us to like provide the characteristics that led to the problem. Like, number what led okay. to falsehood, what led to radical. Okay, good question. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, the characteristics of okay for democratization is because everyone is free to access. Huh? Okay, let me write down here these characteristics. Good question. Um, oh, let me give you some characteristics. Falsehood. Why? Media perpetuates new media perpetuates falsehood because of people can hide behind a veil of anonymity. So they are unafraid to spread false news or yeah. okay maybe hate speech as well okay maybe radicalization as well uh selectivism i think it's just very uh it's very easy very convenient new media is always in the palm of your hands you don't have to go anywhere to do that uh, another reason for okay, everyone can access this minority to a voice everyone is free to publish hate speech another characteristics of hate speech in uh, and division is the profit profit seeking companies new media companies okay maybe it's the algorithm now algorithm so return of recognition falsehood. The other reason for falsehood is exactly what is here. Everyone can publish. Uh, sorry, users lack accountability. That's the characteristics. If you are a reporter, you publish something fake. You go to jail or you, you lose your license. But if you are just a user, you know, nothing can happen to you when you publish false food. Yeah. Stanley, does that answer your question? Yeah. Then uh, do you like classify like example cancel culture as a merit or a problem? Cancel culture is a merit or a problem. Yeah. Uh, it's a double-edged sword.
Number one, it keeps companies accountable, right? Because, oh, if you don't do this, if you perpetuate racism in your advertisements, I'm going to boycott you. It keeps companies accountable. The bad thing is uh, cancer culture it has become so, uh, has led to this phenomenon uh, when people cannot take real social issues seriously. Everything is being picked apart uh, and labeled as racist. People are just trying to find ways to pinpoint racism, pinpoint injustice everywhere. Yeah, so they just cannot be taken seriously anymore. There's real injustice and there's this, no, stupid, like, like this, in my opinion, is like so stupid, so stupid. So if you put a white person, remove the shirt, becomes a black person, it's okay. <laughs> but you do this is wrong, okay? I'm very sure Duff wasn't trying to perpetuate, perpetuate any, any um, you know, racism. So that is the bad kind of cancer culture. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Touching, you have a question. Uh, why media consolidation is bad? Media consolidation is bad because there will be a reduced diversity of opinions. Last time you could hear from 50 different companies on a particular issue. Now you're only hearing from six companies. You don't get that <clears throat> diversity of opinions. Now, the second problem is when it is controlled by only a few companies, it becomes very easily manipulated by uh, powerful organizations of people. Yeah, easily manipulated. It is harder to manipulate 50 companies. It's a lot easier to manipulate just six. This is what we call editorial integrity. Isha, what is, what is the reduced diversity bad thing? Reduced diversity of opinions? Yeah. Mm. And why is it bad? Why is it bad? Diversity <clears throat> uh, is not exactly bad, bad, but it's better to just hear from different sides as compared to just one side, correct? Do you want to hear from just one person or do you want to hear from different people? Yeah. So it gives you more objective um, view of what is happening when you look at it from multiple perspectives. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Hey, KB, will you classify like echo chamber under algorithms? Would I class? Yes, I will classify echo chamber under algorithms. That's correct. Yeah. But is echo chamber more of a problem for new media? It's more of a problem for new media, right? It is only a problem for new media. On traditional media, you, you don't have echo chamber. Traditional, traditional media, you know, you flip the newspaper, you know, it doesn't just show you selected things. But uh, when you log on to Facebook, Instagram, they only show you news that you want to read. Yeah, that's an algorithm problem. Mass media includes both traditional and new. It depends. So you have to decide for yourself whether they're talking about both or just traditional media. Yeah. If this, is, if this question is on government control, well, should there be regulations on the mass media? I will include both. Yeah, I include both. Okay. So it depends. You have to use your discretion. Uh, this one, I cannot answer that question. It depends on the question. Mm. Mm. Kipi, I have a question. Yeah? Um, how do you use like echo kit? Echo chamber. Can you talk about like echo chamber, like perpetuating um polarization? Yeah. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah, correct. I made so a video you... on echo echo chamber. You guys can go and have a read. <laughs> have a so how do you link how do you link polarization in social media? Polarization, so, how do you link polarization to social media? Or how do you like expand on polarization on social media? How do you expand? Like, what is the negative impact of polarization? Is it? Yeah. Mm, polarization itself uh, is bad enough, but if you want to go further, you could say polarization can um, 
it could skew our perspective and make us unable to see things from a more objective way. So pretty similar to this consolidation. Yeah? Skills are perspective. We cannot see things objectively anymore. Can you talk about polarization in the context of like hyper -partisan? Yeah, polarization equals hyperpartisanship. Okay. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> now I made this video on YouTube on echo chamber, right? You can go and have a look at it. It talks about how some people refuse, a lot of young people refuse to date people with a different political view. Oh, you're pro-Trump? I'm pro-Biden, sorry. We cannot be together. <laughs> okay, ridiculous. Huh? If you have a different political view, you cannot be, you, you, you cannot date one another. <laughs> Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, that's it. Enjoy your lunch. I will see you guys uh, this week. Okay? Good, good, good. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Gibby. Yeah, thank you. See you. Uh, thank you, bye. Yeah, thank you, Yahweh. Bye.